embracing the position which, implicitly or explicitly, pervades modern philosophy. He is only distinguished by his clarity of thought. If Santayana's position be granted, there is a phenomenal veil, a primitive credulity associated with action and valuation, and a mysterious symbolism from the veil to the reality behind the veil. The only difference between such philosophers lies in their reading of the symbolism, some read more and some less. There can be no decision between them, since there are no rational principles which penetrate from the veil to the dark background of reality. The organic philosophy denies this doctrine because, first, it is contrary to naive experience. Secondly, memory, is a very special instance of an antecedent act of experience becoming a datum of intuition for another act of experience. Thirdly, seven, the rejected doctrine is derived from the myth. 19 CF. His skepticism and animal faith. Locke and H. U. M. E. 143 Conception of Law, already noted previously, G.M. Part 2, C.H. I. Sect, meet that logical simplicity can be identified with priority in the contrasent process. Locke, in his first two books, he attempts to build up experience from the basic elements of simple, ideas, of, sensation. These simple ideas are practically Santayana's, intuitions of essences. Santayana explicitly, 217 J repudiates the misconception, but in so doing he knocks away one of the two courts of his doctrine. A fourth reason for the rejection of the doctrine is that the way is thereby open for a rational scheme of cosmology in which a final reality is identified with acts of experience. Chapter B from Descartes to Kant. Section I. 218JA comparison of set different ways in which Descartes and Locke respectively conceive the scope of their investigations at once discloses a very important shift which Locke introduced into the tradition of philosophic thought. Descartes asks the fundamental metaphysical question, what is it to be an actual entity? He found three kinds of actual entities, namely, cogitating minds, extended bodies, and God. His word for an actual entity is, substance. The fundamental proposition, whereby the analysis of actuality can be achieved, is the form of predicating the quality of the substance in question. A quality is either an accident or an essential attribute. In the Cartesian philosophy there was room for three distinct kinds of change. One was the change of accidents of an enduring substance, another was the origination of an individual substance, and the third was the cessation of the existence of an enduring substance. Any individual belonging to either of the first two kinds of substances does not require any other individual of either of these kinds in order to exist. But it did require the concurrence of God. Thus the essential attributes of a mind were its dependence on God and its cogitation, and the essential attributes of a body were its dependence on God and its extension. Descartes does not apply the term, attribute, to this, dependence on God, but it is an essential element in his philosophy. It is quite obvious that the accidental relationships between diverse individual substances form a great difficulty for Descartes. If they are to be included in his scheme of the actual, 219 world, they must be qualities of the substance. Thus the relationship is the correlation of a pair of qualities, T1 belonging exclusively to one individual, and the other exclusively to the 
other individual. The correlative itself must be referred to God as one of his accidental qualities. This is exactly Descartes' procedure in his theory of representative ideas. In this theory, the perceived individual has one quality, the perceiving individual has another quality which is the idea. Representing this quality, God is aware of the correlation, and the perceiver's knowledge of God guarantees for him the veracity of his idea. It is unnecessary to criticize this very artificial account of what common sense believes to be our direct knowledge of other actual entities. by Descartes, combined with his assumption of a multiplicity of actual entities. In this assumption of us, 144, from Descartes to Kant, 145 multiplicity of actual entities the philosophy of organism follows Descartes. It is, however, too obvious that there are only two ways out of Descartes. Difficulty. One way is to have recourse to some form of monism, the other way is to reconstruct Descartes' metaphysical machinery. But Descartes asserts one principle which is the basis of all philosophy. He holds that the whole pyramid of knowledge is based upon the immediate operation of knowing which is either an essential for Descartes or a contributory element in the composition of an immediate actual entity. This is also a first principle for the philosophy of organism. form of proposition, and the philosophical tradition derived from it, to dictate his subsequent metaphysical development. For this philosophy, actuality, meant to be a substance with enduring quality. For the philosophy of organism, the percipient equation is its own standard of actuality. If in its knowledge other actual entities appear, it can only be because they conform to its standard of actuality. There can only be 220 evidence of a world of actual entities, if the immediate actual entity discloses them as essential to its own composition. Descartes' notion of an unessential experience of the external world is entirely alien to the organic philosophy. This is the root point of divergence, and is the reason why the organic philosophy has to abandon any approach to the substance quality notion of actuality. The organic philosophy interprets experience as meaning the self-enjoyment of being one among many, and of being one arising out of the composition of many. Descartes interprets experience as meaning the self-enjoyment, by an individual substance, of its qualification by ideas. P. Section 2. Locke explicitly discards metaphysics. His inquiry has a limited scope. This therefore being my purpose, to inquire into the original, certainty, and extent of human knowledge, together with the grounds and degrees of belief, opinion, and assent, I shall not at present meddle with the physical consideration of the mind, or trouble myself to examine wherein its essence consists. It shall suffice to my present purpose, to consider the discerning faculties of a man as they are in, employed about the objects which they have to do with. One the enduring importance of Locke's work comes from the candor, clarity, and adequacy with which he stated the evidence, uninfluenced by the bias of metaphysical theory. He explained, in the sense of stating plainly, and not in the more usual sense of explaining away. By an ironic development,